this lectionary series during the Epiphany of the Lord. This has been the season of the Epiphany of the Lord. It started <clears throat> January 6th. Uh, this coming at Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and at that point we'll start Lent. The Lenten season begins there. And so I invite you, uh, it's in the bulletin somewhere, it's another announcement. There's an Ash Wednesday series. Um, a lot going on. God is doing a lot in and through and with his people here called Arbor Point Church. So I just know that is happening. Uh, so we're finishing up this series, and so the passage of scripture we're on today is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and if you will join with me. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Paul makes a shift in our text for this week there towards the end. He's all about growing things. He's talking about babies and milk and solid food. And then he moves into fields and planting and water, watering. And then at the very end, at the very end, he talks about building, that, that you're God's field and then God's building. And it seems odd until you go on reading, which we're actually going to do a little bit later in the message. Verse 9 is what's called a metaphor hinge or a pivot. It's the point at which he transitions. He swings from one idea to another. It's a great technique because it keeps you from getting too bored because I'm talking about one thing and then you start to drift and then, oh, I'm talking about something new. And then it hinges into a new place. It works very well when there's at least one common element. And Paul's element, one of the common, there's several, but one of that he emphasizes in this passage is that, that, that this thing that we're talking about, this, this following of Jesus is labor intensive, that it's going to take work on our part. It's not just an osmosis kind of thing. We say yes, and the Holy Spirit comes and, and dwells in us, but then there's a, there is a movement in our heart that, that pushes us towards action and doing things a little bit differently. And they, they built or they grew, but then they developed along the way. And the starting place for them was not the ending place, and it's not for us either. The originating state was, was not where things ended up. And however you want to describe it, Paul is stressing to them that there's more to come. There's more on the horizon when, when you follow him. And he wants you to grow. He wanted them to grow. He wants you to grow. He wants me to grow. He wants all of us to grow. The church in Corinth, but he wants Arbor Point Church to grow. You know? God has, uses Paul to speak to us, so that's why he's writing. It's kind of like finally, there's finally a pastoral letter out there, you know, because he, he says, stop acting like children. It's time to grow up. Stop acting like kids. It's not me, me, me. Let, let's, let's get into what Jesus is calling us to do and to be. Paul goes back to the beginnings. Remember when he first arrived and there was so much he wanted to say, but he couldn't because they were infants in Christ. So he met them where they were, which is what we're supposed to do. Meet people where they are. Feeding them milk, <clears throat> excuse me, the ABCs of the faith, knowing that as they continued to seek God, there would be progress, there would be growth, things would get deeper in their lives, there would be, substantial matters would come, on, come up and, and come on, but even now, he argues, they're still not yet ready because they're acting like children. They're quarreling, they're being jealous. And here's a good description of what Paul means when he speaks of being in the flesh. See, it isn't necessarily about a specific type of sin or a specific sin. He lists those and he talks about those. But what he's talking about is anything that, that, that hinders the growth or faith of the individual or the community is sin. What gets between us and our relationship with God is sinful because it pulls us away from what he would have us to be and, have, and who he would have us to be. And these selfish behaviors, even when we do them for supposed good reasons, are of the flesh 
because they come against the common heart and body, uh, uh, heart and mind of the body of Christ. That is us. So he's saying, hey, grow up. It's time. It's time. You've been an adolescent long enough. There's maturities on the horizon. Step into who you've been called to be. So he turns back to what he saw as a dividing issue, right? This allegiance thing. Started out with it, he's back to it. Would it be fair to say that, that his response is basically, we ain't got time for that. Because we don't have time for it. We don't have time for the division and the quarreling. And look, I know where our church is. And I know what we're looking at. I know that we're looking at division. But we, when it comes to spreading the gospel and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, we ain't got time to be fighting with each other. And it's Satan's greatest tool is to turn us against each other. Because now if I'm focused on you and you're focused on me, where aren't we focused? We're not focused on God. We're not focused on the people who don't know him. We're not focused on sharing the gospel. We're focused on selfish things. And Paul's saying, it's time to grow up. We ain't got time. You know, I know it's been thousands of years since he came, but he's coming back. And we don't have, we don't have unlimited time. There is, there is an urgency to our calling that we often forget. And when the day comes, we're going to go, oh, no, I thought I had more time. So we don't share the gospel and we don't share the love of Christ and we fight with each other. And we do all the things that Paul is talking about and it prevents us from becoming who God has created us to be. Pulls us out of the mission field. We talked about the mission. We ain't got, to, we ain't got time for that, right? We ought to put that on the wall. We ain't got time for that. You know? What do we have time for? We got time for telling people about Jesus. Share what you have seen, heard, and experienced of our God. All we have to share is Christ and him crucified. You don't have to have all the biblical knowledge. We, you know, you probably have a voice in your head that says, I don't know enough. That's a lie. Share what you have seen, heard, and experienced of God. It's what Paul did. when he, That's what he's talking about when he said, all I have to share with you. He had all the knowledge, but that's not what his point was. His point was, I have to share with you is Jesus and him crucified. And we have that. We get to share that. There are those who would argue that Paul is all about grace. Grace and not works, right? And his, his theological center is certainly this passage where it is by grace you are saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it's not of works so that nobody can boast. That's his theological center. But this is also the guy who wrote Galatians 5, 22 and 23, right? You know what that is? Somebody tell me, if somebody does. Fruit of the Spirit, right? Fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. Fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? Yes. Come on now, I got that right. Yes. <laughs> Corey's got it. Those are actions, right? This is the fruit. He's not saying that your life doesn't matter. He says that when you're following Jesus, you're going to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the evidence of the life. And that evidence is not invisible. It is an evidence that is seen. Paul and James come together. They don't work apart. James says, faith without works is dead. Paul says this. But they come together. Your salvation is based on grace and your faith. But once you're saved, then you're going to change. Right? Have you seen this right here before or heard it? Yes. Can you? I, I, excuse me. What does it say? Amen. What does it say? Yes. I like that. I think I'm going to say that a lot. You cannot encounter living God and not be changed. Doesn't that make sense? If you encounter God, God, it's not God, it's God. When you encounter God, God, you will be changed. He is going to knock your socks off. He's going to challenge you on stuff that you don't want him to challenge you on. Because he wants you to become more than even you can see. It's that kind of God. It's just who he is. So this life we're called to live is an active God. We are workers in God's field. We are laborers on God's building. That's what binds it all together. It is God's. We are God's. Dividing up, choosing sides, setting up opposing camps hinders the mission does not help the mission. That's Paul. There's no room for us versus them if we're on mission in the church. And I know that that's a lot easier said than done. 
The church in Corinth struggled with it. We struggle with it today. Paul argues that our unity is in our shared mission. That's where we need to be united. It's a mission given by Jesus Christ when he, when he gave us the great commandments, which are love God, love your neighbor as yourself. So love yourself too. Hard one. Do it anyway. Work on it if you can't. I'm struggling. That's my struggle. You know, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, but also the great commission, which we say at the end of each service, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all the things I have taught you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the go. That's the mission. That's what we're supposed to be about. I'm not supposed to be focused on, Daniel, you've got this little thing going on in your life, or Tammy, there's a... No, let's get the mission on. Let's, let's go love people. Let's go love. Let's be whimsical, right? Love does. Just show up. God will do amazing things. Because maybe we've tried to do it ourselves and tried to do it our way long enough. Maybe. Maybe we need to let God give the growth. Do what we can, where we can, but trust, as Corey showed so well, that God takes what we have what we can do, and he makes it flourish. He makes it grow. The question that the lectionary leaves us with during this is this one. What would letting God give the growth look like in your setting? And I think it's a good question, something we need to take some time with during this week, is what would letting God give the growth look like in your setting? It's a good question to ponder, but this was the end of that, but you know that pivot point I talked about? I was, you know, I was wrestling with this message, and I was like, that, that, that's not a good place to stop. You know, so, so we're going to go on. This is, this is verse 10. By, by the great, okay, go ahead and read it with me. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. I think it's important that we see Paul is emphasizing that we're to focus our building on things that pass the test of time, things eternal. You know, my friend Mark Ruiz, who has that, that question I've talked about in the past, what is the eternal significance of this thing that I'm going through? Whatever it is, what is the eternal significance of this? Because we get wrapped up in temporal significance when we need to be focused on eternal significance. We need to seek to grow and encourage the body of Christ in such a way that we're able to see hearts and lives change forever for the better. Change because of worship, because at this time that we come together, the worship that we do inside and outside the walls of this place, because of our commitment to our purpose. You know, our, our purpose here is to inspire people to fulfill God's calling in their life. You have a calling. Our role, our goal here is to help you engage in that and fulfill it. You know, and that's an action helping you to fulfill what that is, because of, also because of our commitment to community inside and outside the walls uh, in, in service, and that's what this is, to live Coram Deo, right? If we do those three things, that worship plus two, then we're gonna live Coram Deo, our entire life in the presence of, under the authority of, and to the glory of God. What we're building is laid upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's our foundation, it cannot be otherwise and stand the test of light. The light of the world, right? Stand the test of light. Each of us are gonna go through a fiery furnace of some kind. Anybody tells you you're gonna accept Jesus and everything's gonna be perfect from then on, I'm lying to you. You're gonna go through some fiery furnaces in this life. We have promised that. Jesus himself promised us that there's gonna be suffering. It's going to happen. Life is in session. And we're going to be present if we're going to follow Jesus. Life of complete engagement, as Bob Goff would say. So when we go through those things, we're going to be tested. And that testing place is going to reveal to us what we've built. Our foundation is, is secure in Jesus. And then we build upon that. And we build the house that we build. 
we'll be tested by the things that we go through. And we're going to find out if some of that's going to burn up or if it's going to stand the test. Or we'll really find out as well, too, I really have my foundation in Jesus. It's going to, it's going to bring all that to bear. The good news, though, is this, as our pastors continue us, join me. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Hang on just a second. So I want you to, who is God's temple? Okay, repeat that last part for God's temple. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. What does that make you? Sacred. This world's going to try and rob you of that. Don't you are children of God, sons and daughters of the King. You are sacred. Let that settle. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think that you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. We are God's temple when we say yes to him. And even if we messed up on our carpentry or the masonry on the building of the house, the foundation is secure. It's in Christ. The building, we are going to mess up some point, sometimes. We're going to put a, an unsquare corner in. We may... Break a window. We may do all kinds of stuff as we build on this. But we get second chances. We get third chances. We get fourth chances. You know what else we get? Fifth, Fifth chances. And sixth chances. It's never ending. You get more chances. Keep your eye on the cross and on Jesus and keep building. Even when it gets, if it gets raised to the ground, if the building that we built it gets raised to the ground, you get to rebuild it. You get to rebuild it. And when we, the temple is focused on God's glory and not our own, we are in the right direction. When we build under the authority, in the presence of, to the glory of God, we are building correctly. And hear this. It may not look like what the world would call beautiful, and it may not look like what the world would call lovely, but in God's eyes, it will be beautiful. And it will be lovely. And this admonishment at the end is important. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours. And you are, are of Christ and Christ is of God. Amen. And I think there are wonderful teachers in each age. Men and women who we look, can look to for spiritual wisdom. It's from Peter and Paul to Augustine and Aquinas. And John and Charles Wesley and John Calvin and George Whitfield and Mother Teresa and Origen and Billy Graham and Andy Stanley, Beth Moore, Francis Chan, so many more. You could go on and on. There are teachers that, that are gifted to us in this age. And it's easy to become a disciple of fill-in-the-blank teacher. It's easy to do that. And we forget that each of them, you know what they're here for? Is to help us in our journey. They're to provide help. As we seek to draw closer to God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. All things are yours, regardless of your teacher, regardless of life or death or time. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is of God. I found this, John Piper wrote this. I'm not a huge fan of John Piper, but I, I'm a fan of what he wrote here. This is a graduation uh, text that he gave to the Beth Bethlehem College that takes from this passage. He says it very well. He says this, he says, Paul is yours, your father in the faith, the one who betrothed you to Christ, the, the one who suffers countless hardships to build you up, the most prominent apostle outside Israel, the writer of scripture. You are not his. 
He is yours. We are not of Paul. We are of Christ. Amen. Apollos is yours. All his Alexandrian eloquence, all his rhetorical brilliance, all his intellectual powers, all his newly refined theology, all his edgy demeanor that pushes the envelope outside the established apostolic band. He is yours. You're not his. You're not of Apollos. You're of Christ. Cephas is yours. This is Peter. Cephas is yours, the original one, the one whose words go all the way back to Jesus himself on the earth, the one who heard him, saw him, touched him, smelled him, confronted him, defended him, denied him. Peter, the pillar. Peter, the rock. You are not his. He is yours. The world is yours. The whole world, the world with all its negative connotations in this chapter. God made foolish the wisdom of the world. 1 Corinthians 1.20, the world did not know God, 121. We did not receive the spirit of the world, this world, this whole natural, sinful, broken, painful, beautiful, horrible, hopeful world is yours, not just part of it. All things, you are not the victims of the world, it is not your master, it is your servant. From the most beneficial beauties to the most malignant cancers. From the most beneficial beauties to the most malignant cancers. It is yours. Everything in it. Everything that happens on it is working together for your greatest and longest good. For God works all things to the good. All things for those who are called according to his purpose. It's upside down, this is God, I know. Things I think are bad are often good for me, and things I think are good are bad for me. Life is yours, every breath you take, every beat of your heart, every day you face, every night you sleep, Every movement you make, every word, every deed, every relationship, every accomplishment, every plan, failed or successful. Every emotion that rises, every thought that passes, every book read, every line tweeted, every text sent, every conversation, every gift given, every sin committed. All of it, all your life is yours. You don't belong to it. It belongs to you. And it's great that our God works all things to the good. Amen. Death is yours. No death wears your sting. It's on Golgotha's empty cross. Death wears your victory. It's on the empty grave outside Jerusalem. Death doesn't win. Then what are you, death? Death is your servant, serving you while you live to make you wise and serious and fruitful and hopefully give you a sense of urgency that you ain't got forever here to get after it. That was my part, sorry. <laughs> death will serve you when you die to bring you home to Jesus. You don't belong to death. Death belongs to you. The present is yours. All things are yours now. Every moment of your life is yours. Every moment is your servant. Every moment is a stroke of the divine brush on the canvas of the final masterpiece called you. Every moment. The sad moments, the happy moments, the fearful moments. The bold moments, the lonely moments, the grieving moments, the ecstatic moments, the sleeping moments, all the moments, the present is yours. You are not the slave of time or chance or any sequence of events. They are yours. They serve you. What are you going to do with them? Oh, I did it again. He didn't say that. But I ask you, what are you going to do with them? these moments that are God's emissaries to bring you to glory? Finally, the future is yours. Nothing will come to you in the future. The future of 10 seconds from now, 10 days, 10 months, 10 years, 10, 10 centuries, 10 millennia, 10 ages of millennia, nothing will come to you that is not your servant. You don't belong to the future. The future belongs to you because you are Christ. Because you are Christ, therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. All means all. Oh. That's what Paul's getting at in this. He's saying, look, all of these things that we don't necessarily attribute as ours, they're yours. It's important that we grab hold of them. Whether Paul or Papalus or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. How can this be? Because you are Christ. You are Christ's and Christ is God's. You are Christ. You belong to him the way a hand belongs to a body, the way a bride belongs to a husband, the way a subject belongs to a king, the way a brother belongs to a brother in one family. And Christ is God's. Why does belonging to Christ make all things yours? Because Christ is God's. You are Christ's 
and Christ is God's. Who is this Christ we talk about? Christ is God's son, John 3.16, God's word, John 1.1. 1, 1. Christ is God's image, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Christ is God's beloved, Matthew 17.5. God's radiance and God's essence, Hebrews 1.3. Christ is God's heir, 1.2. All that God the Father is or can be or can do for one like himself, he is and does for Christ. And we are to be one as who? The Father and Son are one. You see how all this weaves together into a journey that we're on. And it's all because you are Christ. All the Father is, or can be, or can do for a creature. He is and does for you because you are Christ. And Paul's message becomes very clear in this passage because he, what he's saying is embrace this life as it is. You don't have to be happy about stuff. You don't have to be happy. In fact, you're not going to be happy about some of the things that happen in your life. Embrace them anyway because God will work them to the good because you're in him. Recognize that God is with you. God is with me. We are God's temple, which means that whatever befalls me, whether I deem it good or I deem it bad, God's going to take and he's going to turn it into good. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Plant seeds, water, God gives the growth. Amen.